Those of you who are parents can easily understand what a pleasure it is to be sitting on the stage with my daughter. <laughs> we have, in past years, co-taught in the same classroom. Years ago, maybe five, seven years ago, something like that. Uh, and uh, we do spend a lot of time talking about these kinds of issues, the issues that this conference is dealing with, really serious issues. We don't really talk about what's the best movie to see <laughs> or what club has the best dancing. <laughs> she knows, but, but that's not what we talk about. We pretty much only talk about the most serious of matters, and that's fine with me. Now, we have a charge and a short amount of time, and we have not prepared, except in our own minds. And I have, of course, thought about this, and I have some opening remarks. There are two types of meetings. This is a meeting to basically build a community, a community of interest, an attendant community. But it's not a meeting that can move the field forward. With 10, 15, even 30-minute presentations, for every speaker that was here, they could have used a half day at least to tell you what they have learned and where they want to go. So how do we move it forward? It's with a different type of meeting, a type of meeting I've been to on other topics. Never, there's never been one on compassion, that I, at least that I know about. And what you do is you get a group of, you could probably take any of the panels of speakers that were here, and you have them identify what do you think are questions that it would be useful to address. And you take the ones that they agree on, and there will be agreement about it, and then you assign people and usually you pay them to prepare working papers, to spend the time on a working paper that will be discussed. And then you have a meeting in which four or five people already decided about, re have read that working paper, and they try to think it through and come out with some concrete research plans. This has been very successful in a number of fields of science. It's a very different kind of meeting. We need to have that kind of meeting, uh, is my belief. Not that this kind of meeting has to stop, but this is an entirely different type of meeting. And someone, it, I was looking at her, not me, Someone needs to organize it and plan it. A lot of the preliminary work is done. You could take, really, if you took the list of people who have been here for the last four days, you've got a very good group to start with to figure out what are the three, four, five issues that we might be able to move forward on, what are the working papers and who should write them, and then you've got to allow six months to a year before you then have the meetings. Uh, it's a very common procedure. We need to use it in this area. So I guess in, in terms of thinking about this meeting and the future and moving ahead, I may have a little bit of a different perspective. That's also no surprise. Um, even though we talk about, uh, as my dad suggested, often research and ideas and philosophy, um, we agree just enough for it to be enjoyable, 
uh, but also have enough we don't agree on for it to kind of continue to compel our interest. Um, I, I believe in an earlier session, my dad asked for people to raise their hands of who were researchers and who were practitioners. And in my view or my vision, what I think would really help us and already is helping us move forward is to recognize that we can be both. We can be both practitioners and researchers. We can invite people, especially in a forum like this, to be really thoughtful about their own experiences, to not just you know, track them with their daily app and forget about it a week later, um, but really think about habits, think about patterns, think about, um, as Dan Gilbert was suggesting earlier in the day, what is the nature of our mind? What is it like? Uh, what this meeting is about is compassion and what compassion is about is, is helping others. And what many people have discussed, um, including Paul Gilbert, is how do we have compassion for ourselves? It's really the gateway to compassion for others. I really believe that that must happen with our own ability to do research, or as some people call it, me-search on ourselves. What's going on for us? How do we use these new technologies, what we know from science already, to really explore our experience, uh, individual experience, with some rigor. Now, if I were to say what I think would be very useful in the future of science as we know it, it's that doing work in a lab is wonderful, but so isolated from the issues that matter the most to us. We don't need a laboratory to kind of create a, uh, a proxy of suffering or adversity or joy or empathy. We see it in the real world, we just don't know how to capture it. So what I would hope for looking forward is a way to really um, kind of, there's an idea of community participatory research. Um, I say it with quotes because it already exists. I didn't create this idea. But how do we really engage people in collecting their data and understanding at a deeper level the nature of our mind, the nature of compassion, in a way that includes us all and maybe kind of in some ways helps soften the separation between the researchers, the practitioners, and the rest of us? Well, I can't find much to disagree with. <laughs> um, the 60 years ago, the American Psychological Association uh, proposed what was called the Colorado model, that all clinical psychologists would be both psychotherapists and scientists. It didn't work. Both are very demanding. Uh, most people found that you can't really do both simultaneously. It's just the mindsets are different and the obligations are different. You end up choosing primarily one or the other. I do also want to comment, I don't want to throw out the laboratory. I want to use methods that we've developed in the laboratory, particularly observational methods. The methods I've developed for measuring facial movement that allow you to precisely examine what you see in the real world, those are all developed in the laboratory. We need the laboratory. We need to look in the real world. And on many problems, the place to start is observation in the real world. Some problems you have to start in the lab, but many you start in the real world. Sometimes you can get laboratory analogs or laboratory techniques you can bring in to real world situations. Psychology lost its connection about 20 or 30 years ago, a large part of psychology with real-world social issues. Compassion is a critical one. Uh, I kid that there's an unwritten rule in academic psychology, which is that if it's useful, it's not important. <laughs> this is useful because it is important. And I expect that over the next decade, we will find university programs organized around the study of compassion and the teaching of compassion. Now, I distinguish between proximal 
compassion for someone who's immediately in your presence, and distal compassion where you're trying to prevent suffering in the future. The Dalai Lama tells me the same distinction is made in Tibetan thinking, slightly different terms. And distal compassion requires really good social forecasting, anticipating and preventing disasters. But we can anticipate and see many disasters on a global level, from climate warming to energy shortage. But there are ones on a personal level. Someone came up to me in the walk from the last meeting room to this one and said, can you help me with what I say to the patients I work with who are dying and who know they are dying? Huge problem, huge issue. I don't know what to say. I know we could try to find out what would be helpful to different kinds of people. Eve mentioned in her talk the importance of individual differences. Although we all have the same emotions, we all experience them in somewhat different ways. And we have to honor those differences and recognize them. So I want to see more observational research. I want to see more looking in the real world for what are the problems we need to try to tackle. And I want to see us, to the extent that it's possible, use laboratory analogs and laboratory methods in the real world. But we need working groups, groups that will, it's amazing what you can accomplish in three or four days if that's all you're doing is talking to a small group of people for three or four days and you've, the spade work has been done for you that you can prepare and read. Uh, we need more, we need some of those kinds of meetings and we aren't having them uh, in this field. We're ha having meetings to build community, not to build knowledge. I guess I would, um, I would say that community is an important piece, of course, the groundwork in which we need to, to move forward. But I think, you know, there was a question that even um, Steve Porges asked last night while we were at dinner, which is, if we're all compassionate, open, kind of resonating to one another, um, is there a danger? Is there a concern? Is that make us in some ways uh, less protected against the difficulty or dangers in the world? He described a kind of warrior class. Do you remember this? He said, a warrior class of people who are responsible for doing the difficult work, experiencing violence and trauma and aggression, whereas the rest of us can be removed from it. Um, and I know you've spent most of your life um, looking at how to create meaningful social change. And I love this idea of compassion for research and for knowledge, but I also want us to think through the lens of how do we help the people who possibly need it the most? in the most difficult situations with the most challenging um, everyday life circumstances? Well, of course, we're in a unique period in the history of this country in having our wars fought by professionals, volunteers, not by the, system, the citizenry. And they're concerned with compassion not just compassion for them, of which there seems to be a bit more than there were for the Vietnam veterans, uh, but the compassion they feel for their fellow warriors, and they need to. That's crucial within the group, within any military group. So they're highly compassionate people who are engaged in the business of killing. may seem very contradictory. Uh, in some ways it is, and in some ways it isn't. But the, the biggest issue that I see is symbolically represented by the two of us, because the future of compassion is my handing the torch to you, kiddo. <laughs> it's 
it's a younger, a new generation of researchers and practitioners who are going to move this field forward while us oldsters take a back seat and applaud. <laughs> Didn't, didn't answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> relentless. She is relentless. Give me the question again. About the adversity and how, how we deal with the folks who might maybe need these uh, practices the most. So people living in uh, violent and dangerous situations, people living with complex trauma, people who have a lot of everyday difficulties that they're facing. And as much as we should focus on the youth and focus on adults, um, how also do we bring up you know, we're only, as, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And in this country, we have a, a lot that we need to strengthen in order to feel any sort of buoyancy. Well, I, you know, I think that's, again, a topic that requires study, observation, and examination. We just don't have the information. It's not that we need to get new tools in order to do it. We've got all the tools to take a look. Uh, to do this work. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to push is creating a database of people who uh, manifest in their lives a global compassionate concern. We know they're there. Actually, we've been reading about a number of them with this Ebola business, the ones who are going over there try to help them, but there's a lot of others. But we haven't in any way organized this to a way where we can take a look at, you know, who are these people? Monroe is the best database I know, and that's 10 years old, and it's from World War II. Uh, but it did suggest <clears throat> that there wasn't anything unique about them demographically. But she never looked at anything psychological, so we still don't know. But the first step is let's, let's create a database of people who are leading compassionate lives. How did this happen? Where did it come from? What can we learn from them? That's a question of uh, Kristen Monroe wrote a book, and the idea was what are these people who are so exceptional taking people into their homes during the Nazi occupation? And my question or my interest that I'm sure is shared by many in the audience is, can compassion actually be a treatment? Not something we're looking at as those who are compassionate in their action, but is compassion um, a treatment, a way to help people recover, um, maybe feel a little more at ease or a little more stable, an alternative to pharmacology and other kinds of treatments? And as you're speaking, I think, one of the biggest uh, issues is, you know, how do we prioritize the research in these areas? We indeed don't need new tools. We don't need new access. Uh, we, but we do need there to be the kind of imperative and impetus that this is important. We need to help those who need it the most. It seems the absence of compassion um, is at the beginning of that problem where we don't care fundamentally. We don't have enough um, concern to really share the interest with those who need it the most? Well, the fact that even at this late hour or this day, there's still this many people sitting here, people do care. Hmm. There's caring. There isn't knowledge. There isn't information. There's hopes. You just mentioned a hope that it could be a treatment. Maybe it can be. Maybe it can't be. We don't know. We could find out. We don't need new tools to find out. We just need to do the research to find out. Is compassion teachable? Can everyone be taught? <laughs> I heard a yes, but I, I know the answer is we don't know. Yes, there, I don't disrespect, but I don't think the evidence is definitive, okay? So it's, can everybody? The Dalai Lama believes the point of entry is four to eight years old. That's where we should put our time. He also believes that you can't get everyone to have a global compassionate concern. That not all human beings are going to get there. 
Is he right? He could be wrong. He knows he could be wrong. In fact, if he was wrong, he would be really happy. <laughs> but we haven't tried. And so uh, maybe it's I've spent, since I've spent a lifetime doing research, I see that there is research of various kinds could give us information that would allow us to know where to put time, where to put effort, with who, at what age, with what expectations. Matthew Ricard, a man I have a great respect for, and who will be in the Bay Area the first week of June. If you uh, email me, I'll be able to give you information on where he will be appearing. Uh, and uh, Matthew is a really quite an amazing person, although he wrote a book on altruism that is 700 pages long. I tried to, I told Matthew, no one's going to read 700 pages. That's what it takes, that's what he did. But Matthew believes, he uses the metaphor, we cannot all become Olympic javelin throwers, but only some people who have a gift, but everyone can learn to throw it better than they do. Now that's a different, that's an answer very similar to the Dalai Lama's answer by no accident. But this is not something, don't set the bar that everyone has to reach the same level of compassionate concern as the Dalai Lama or Matthew Ricard. But that might be wrong. We might be underselling what is possible. We need to find out. We really do need to find out and not close it off. So uh, a, a closing question uh -huh. is um, for myself and the other researchers in the room, you were saying we need research. Um, I definitely agree. I definitely agree we need more research, especially understand the mechanisms of what part of meditation or compassion might work, for whom, when. We really just don't know a lot of the basics of what's going on. And not only is there potential to not help as many people as possible, there's a potential, in fact, for harm, um, to be able to really clarify with more precision what we're giving to people and why. But my question to you would be, where do you think is kind of the first line that we need to be focusing on? And I know, it's big. Just the first line, where do we start? If you had the human interaction laboratory, imagine going after school, as I did every day, getting off the bus and trying to sneak in with this huge sign on the top of the laboratory, human interaction laboratory. <laughs> I was so embarrassed, it's so funny. And now I have the old signs from the- In your own apartment. In my own yeah. apartment, yeah. There isn't one place I would start. I would start descriptively. I, I'm a taxonomist. I would start with a taxonomy of compassionate acts. We don't have one. How do we know what an act is compassionate? What are the examples in what kinds of social contexts? It has to be multicultural. We have every reason to believe this is something we see in other mammals, so we have to see it in other cultures. But the taxonomy has to deal with cultural variables. So that's one step. A second step I've already mentioned is a compendium, a database of individuals where there's just no doubt they're leading a compassionate life. It's the organizing principle of their life. What little we know suggests that their only difference between them and anybody else, and the Buddhists were like this, is in their world view. For them, everyone is their child. They feel towards total strangers 
the way most of us feel without preparation towards our offspring. Why? How does that happen? But first, how many people are there like that? And what's been their life experience and upbringing? And when did it first appear and was recognized? We know it's there. We just don't know much about it. So that would be the second high priority project. And that's enough for me. <laughs> I never could work on more than two things at once. Great. Well, I think we are out of time for the evening. But thank you all so much for hanging out with us here. Lovely to have you. I have faith in the future. <laughs>